greetings. My name is Rick Gibson. I'm the Senior Vice Chancellor at Pepperdine University. I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, David Kinneman, who is the president of Barna. Barna is a research firm that looks into all matters uh, related to the church uh, and its uh, current state and its future. Uh, David, good to be with you. You too, Rick. Yeah. David and I are uh, friends. We've gone back quite a ways. ways. We worked on an interesting project together, uh, State of Pastors. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, I know that many of our viewers mm. have either um, benefited from that, have read it, or participated in some way in that important project. Um, I think back on that, and I can't, like anyone, imagine the kind of year that we have had um, and, and, and the way it has uh, sort of reset things, changed things. Um, I know when we were working on State of Pastors, we were looking at a whole set of concerns, questions, but nothing prepared us to think about this. First things first, how are you? Uh, how are you doing during this really crazy, difficult year? I know you've had some loss and uh, you have our sympathies and condolences, but David, how are you doing right now? Yeah, thanks. Well, it's fun to have you here, yeah, here, here, here. here in our studio here in Ventura. Yeah. And um, I'm doing okay. Um, you know, we've had uh, such a crazy year uh, as, a, as a whole world. I mean, what sort of unifying and also sort of ch challenging circumstances that that everyone has gone through in terms of the coronavirus and the sort of the cascade of crises that have happened in 2020. Right. And um, so, you know, leading a small business has been challenging. Um, leading myself, you know, just sort of the, when the quarantine hit and, you know, we were here in the studio every day just doing Zoom meetings and webinars and calls and everything. So, you know, everything just sort of changed on a dime. Um, as for as a, a researcher, it was like I spent 25 years practicing what it would be like to measure cultural change in, a, in an instant, right? And so that was a lot of fun, uh, but also, you know, just as so many of, of us have been, just exhausting. Yeah. Um, and then as you mentioned on a personal level, you know, my wife of 25 years passed away in October of 2020. Yeah. And so we're, uh, we're just devastated by her loss and not the way uh, God designed it. And, you know, my three kids and I are sort of um, forming a new, a new sort of family and a new way of being in the world. And, you know, we'll always be defined by that loss, but we're getting uh, good therapy and talking to people and making good, good memories and food and, you know, travel and all the things that you do to try to, try to just, you know, make your way forward in the world. But um, uh, it's been heartbreaking. It's been very, very hard. And yet through all that, I don't, I don't doubt the Lord's faithfulness any less than I did uh, you know, before she got sick. And um, uh, that was actually her favorite song, uh, Great Is Thy Faithfulness. Yes. Um, and uh, at her funeral, we, she wanted that song to be sung. It was sung at her wedding. Hmm. And, uh, and then my dad said, hey, you know, it was right, the last few minutes right before we were preparing to go uh, do, the, do the funeral service. And my dad said, you know, I think I'm gonna read uh, this section from Lamentations, which is Great Is Thy Faithfulness. Wow. And, um, you know, he, he was like, did you know that was like a part of a, lam a lament? And so it's this really interesting thing that we can sing about God's faithfulness even as we lament. And so yeah. I think that really defines, uh, defines how I'm doing today. Well, uh, you know your Pepperdine family uh, thinks about you, has been praying for you. And so uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, in one way or another, we've all f experienced loss in so many different ways. Right. Uh, I had mentioned to you earlier I'd lost my dad. And... Um, and e even, you know, church life around that moment right. changed so much, you know. So, um, well, we, we've, we've gathered with a lot of church leaders right now through this conference to talk about <laughs> how uh, the world has changed uh, on a personal level, how the church has responded or not responded, how mm -hmm. they have responded. Um, we're all trying to grasp what's going on. How did... How did this happen? What is happening? Um, as I think about the project we worked with, we were asking some of these questions, of course, pre-quarantine, pre-COVID-19. Right. We were asking things like, um, you know, how pastors, uh, ministers, church leaders viewed their calling. Were they optimistic about their calling several years later? Had it grown or had it weakened? Um, they were uh, concerned about uh, their ministries. Some were optimistic, others were not. On a personal level, they were worried about finances and were they prepared to retire or any number of things that we looked at. It was really an amazing study. And I think one of Barna's 
uh, first around this kind of yeah. model. Um, remind me of some of the things we were talking about before the whole world changed. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was one of the first big studies that we had done on sort of the health and well-being of pastors. Uh, George Barna, an amazing founder of this company, had done quite a bit of work in the 90s, which we built sort of the, the state of pastors, which had come out in 2017, uh, uh, which we, we launched with our, our great friends at Pepperdine. Yeah. And uh, so many people have asked me, like, wow, well, how did you, how'd you pull that off? And it's like, well, you know, the, the facilities and the hospitality and the energy of, of the Pepperdine community and, and our, our patrons on that project. The Brown family was such a you know, wonderful experience for us because we were able to sort of take all this background from the 90s and sort of bring it forward right. in, a, in a bigger, more robust way. I think we compiled information for more than 10,000 pastors for that study um, just to really try to understand really what were three different areas, sort of how they lead themselves and their family, uh, how they lead within the context of a local congregation and then how that congregation is situated within uh, the larger culture. So self-leadership, church leadership, and cultural leadership. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in a lot of ways, uh, the things that we've been tracking this year, uh, we've been doing this really fun podcast called Church Pulse Weekly, um, sort of mid-March of 2020. Yeah. Uh, my friend Kerry Newhoff and I decided to create this podcast. Yeah, I've been uh, listening. It's yeah, good. that would focus in on, um, uh, you know, just the trends of the week. and. And so um, a lot of the, the things that we've been, we've been tracking have been measured against those baselines that you know, started in the 90s, but then especially reinforced in, uh, in, in uh, 2017. Mm -hmm. And so you know, how ch church leaders are doing, I mean, one of the, you know, obviously many industries have been hit very hard, but one of the most significant disruptions to ministry uh, life that I think anyone could have imagined a pandemic um, and, um, you know, all the challenges of the political environment and, you know, sort of race and racial injustice. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the short answer is a lot of pastors are really struggling. 29% um, of pastors told us in one of our Church Pulse Weekly surveys that they've given real serious consideration to quitting in the last year. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, you know, for so many people who get into ministry, my father, lifelong pastor of a big church in Phoenix, I, f I sort of figured I'd be a pastor. I sort of think of my role here as a sort of pastoral researcher. Uh, but for many of us who, who are in the, the, the work of convening people, uh, you know, at least once a week and meetings throughout the week and other things, um, we're not getting the usual feedback from people. You know, we had to right. innovate around technology. We had to innovate around practice and community. What is essential? What's not essential? How do you take communion? How do you do baby dedications, how do you do funerals right. and weddings during uh, the quarantine. And um, as we've been talking about just before we went on camera here that, you know, there's some things that are gonna return in some fashion, but there are many more things I think that won't return. And, you know, there's just many different ways in which sort of this disruption has sort of fundamentally changed the way, the way church leadership is gonna look, mm -hmm. um, just as it's changed so many other areas of our society. Um, so um, at the same time, a lot of churches have been hit hard, a lot of pastors have been sort of like, they realize they're on the field along with the people they're serving. It's not like they're coaching anymore. They're sort of on the field trying to figure out which plays to call um, for themselves, the mental and emotional anxiety, all those, t the toll, the, toll the, the pandemic has taken, uh, hit us all, whatever kind of leader you are, whatever kind of person you are. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I'm so proud to see the number of ways that leaders sort of um, stood up for their communities, served into their communities, were innovative around technology and efforts. They, they were you know, sort of evaluating their motivation for ministry in new and fresh ways. I feel like this has been a great revealer yes. of who we are as people and really our, our dependence on the Lord. Yes. You know, it, it is if, it's as if every 800 pound gorilla or elephant that was in the room has been awakened and they're in a rage still, you know? Right. And, and so their ministers are dealing with whatever unfinished business there was prior to the quarantine, and those have in some ways been uh, uh, highlighted or accelerated. Um, some pastors we're hearing about and some ministers we're learning, certainly within the Churches of Christ, and especially with smaller congregations, um, they're leaving ministry not by their own choice. Mm -hmm. uh, their churches have seen uh, diminished um, uh, contributions, uh, church giving is down, uh, maybe in some ways and other ways not. I'd be interested in what you might know about that, but 
um, we, we know of some ministers, many who are probably even just watching today, mm -hmm. um, that they lost their jobs. The, the, the yeah. church could no longer afford to keep them. Well, it was one of the things that we took a little heat uh, from, uh, from, from uh, our, our research early on in the pandemic. We were predicting that as many as one in five churches would go out of business in the next three years. Hmm. Um, we're only a year or so into that prediction. Yeah. Um, I think it won't be as large of that number. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty significant number when you look at the total. There's 322,000 Protestant churches in America. And so, uh, what would that be? 20% uh, of that's, you know, uh, uh, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 churches. I'll need to let you do the math. Yeah, right that's right. Well, on the fly here. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, 50 to 60,000 churches, and um, that's a lot of churches. Um, but the, the, the thing is that I believe there's all these, what, like in, the, in the, all the uh, public health conversation around, lo around people, human beings, there was all this discussion around comorbidities of, yes. of people. Um, you know, if you had asthma, if you're old, older, you know, different, different factors. And I think that what we're seeing today is um, the comorbidities of churches that were smaller or they were dealing with other kind of fundamental challenges of um, the demographics of their area or the finances or, yes. or you know, underlying challenges related to denominationalism. Um, I'm a big believer that God, you know, if we sort of zoom way out, God wasn't surprised by the pandemic. Uh, the church is gonna prevail in yes. the end. Uh, the message of Jesus' death and resurrection is light and hope in a dark world. Um, societies come and go, changes, cultural changes happen. Um, there's nothing new under the sun, but, but, it, but 2020 was certainly a different kind of year than any of us had predicted. Um, and for all those reasons, I actually think, you know, for, for leaders who are listening in, um, I want you just to, I mean, I've lost my wife in this last year, and it was a horrific challenge to lead a company, lead my family, lead myself through all that. And so I don't say any of this with any um, uh, sort, sort of um, criticism, but like the Lord knows what he's doing. He's changing the church from the inside out. Mm. There's a, one of my life verses is Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I'm doing a new thing, and now it springs up, and do you not perceive it? Now that doesn't take uh, an iota of uh, the challenges that leaders have faced. If you're a leader who's listening and you know, you've know you lost your, your, your sense of career, your sense of calling, um, you know, I'm so sorry. And it's, it's like the Lord still loves us and still wants to use us. He still wants to use you. Uh, but the things that we've built around ourselves, um, you know, the institutions, the, the brands, we were talking before we started, you know, just the nature of right. Jobs and lives, and you know, families, and all these things. The, the nature of how we, we set our, our feet on solid ground. Um, God wants us to constantly move away from the things we build for ourselves yes. to the things He wants us to build our lives on. Yeah. You know, Jesus' metaphor of you know, don't build your house on sand, but build your house on the rock. Yeah. And so, um, I think there are all these comorbidities within the church. Things that the Lord was trying to stir up. You know, race and racial justice and white supremacy. Um, uh, looking at issues of, of um, you know, how, how the church is structured for discipleship. I'm, I'm convinced that we need different kinds of wineskins to disciple in the digital age. The questions of Generation Z, the very students of Pepperdine, our own kids and grandkids right. are looking for a different kind of questions around the plausibility, the believability of faith, where we get our information, how we believe, like what does it mean to live a good and, and flourishing human life. Um, these are incredible uh, and important questions. P places like Pepperdine are at the heart of trying to disciple a generation. Your churches are at the heart of trying to disciple younger generations. And so I just feel like there's such, like I have so much hope about how the pandemic churns up all of this stuff. Yes. New ground um, to, to be able to plant new, new seeds. I, I drive into work here, there's in Ventura County, it's a pretty agricultural community, right. and uh, lots of strawberry fields, and you know the seeds, the seasons, and it's always cool to just watch. There's this one big plot of land along the 101 freeway, and every every time you come by, it just the plants are taller, or the the, har the uh, you know the, the harvesters are out, uh, and just recently they were just putting in new pipes, and um, it's all it's all plowed up, putting in new pipes to water it, and I'm just like I'm just looking at the the science and the the art of farming, and um, yeah. For those of us who are spiritual leaders, it's like, yeah, God's, God's got a new season for us to be planted in mm -hmm. some new ways. 
And uh, again, there's no taking back some of the losses of this last year, uh, but could we use these losses to go deeper and deeper into, into Christ himself? Yeah. I'd like to circle back to the comorbidity question here in a moment, but, but David, I, I take uh, some encouragement from uh, our forefathers many, many years ago. The early church uh, had some of its best moments in the midst of crisis, mm -hmm. uh, a plague. Um, it became uh, an opportunity to demonstrate what it meant to love your neighbor. Yeah. Um, I, I am interested in just how um, the church uh, doesn't really shine in the same way when it's in a position of power, right. but when it's uh, actually in a position uh, of uh, uh, suffering or, or of weakness, and that's when it draws on the strength of, uh, of God through Christ. Um, I was just looking at the section of scripture uh, this, this last week about abiding in Christ and that sort of he who ab abides in Christ produces much fruit. And for some reason it never had, had uh, occurred to me because I'm an ambitious and busy body kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And um, this idea of abiding in Christ is actually uh, equated with producing. And this upside down kingdom yes. of you know, the things that you think you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, he who builds the house without the Lord labor in vain and um, you know the idea of abiding in Christ is actually our best means of producing, and the the paradox of that just really struck me. Yeah. And um, you know, I think that's part of what I'm hopeful about for the church today. All the things that we were sort of striving pre-pandemic to accomplish, the Lord is like, all right, enough of that. You know, yep. let's just see if we can sort of rebuild around around Christ Himself. Yeah. And um, again, I think there's some great hope in that. I do too. Um, it'd be interesting to ask. Uh, uh, the ministers, pastors, church leaders at large, uh, what scripture they read differently now, you mm. know, through this lens, you know. Uh, we've all read through the Bible before and, and, and been surprised by a scripture we'd never read. Mm -hmm. Well, our situation had changed. And somehow it just, for me, it's, um, it, it, it really does demonstrate the Bible as the living word. I mean, That's it, right. it meets you where you are. Um, so it'd be interesting. I imagine we're all reading passages uh, either differently or for the first time under mm -hmm. these conditions. Um, let me let me circle back to that comorbidity question. Um, I, I'm wondering what you are seeing, whether it's in the data or interviews or whatever. But what are those things that are putting churches at risk, either during the quarantine or what you see? Uh, I'd love to start there, but yeah. we might go as to what you may be seeing down the road, but. What are those two or three or four things that might be uh, something church leaders need to be paying attention to? This last two years, we've been doing quite a bit of work um, with a technology partner called Glue, and we've been focusing on what we call these five areas of human flourishing and 16, 15, 16 areas of church thriving. And so part of the answer to that question is it's not easy. There's not just one or two things, mm -hmm. right? It's sort of like a, a body system. I mean, you can tell quite a bit just through a pulse, but um, it's a, it's a pretty complex, churches are complex organisms. Um, still, we actually have a thing called the church pulse and it's a free assessment you can take uh, and look at the areas of flourishing and the thriving of your, of your church. And, um, and it's things like how well are we paying attention to all of the, uh, all aspects of the lives of the people we're trying to serve. So when it comes to human flourishing, their spiritual well-being but their mental and emotional well-being, their relational well-being, their vocational well-being, their mm -hmm. physical well-being. It turns out that the churches that are most effective, that have the least sort of uh, challenging comorbidities, really care about the whole person, not just the soul. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're, they care for the communities, the, you know, the flourishing of all the, of, of all the people in, in their communities. Um, and then in terms of these areas of, of church thriving, um, and again, you can find it on our, on our Barna.com website and check out Church Pulse and you can sort of yeah. use this free assessment just to see how your people are doing and how well you're thriving as a church. Um, and it's things like, you know, how oriented are we towards the next generation? Are we, you know, are we mostly trying to serve, you know, the older insiders? You know, churches naturally grow older and more insidery as they, as they age mm -hmm. and has become more, have greater co comorbidities. Uh, but those most healthy churches are growing younger 
and they're growing, uh, they're growing outward into community-facing efforts as well as, as growing the discipleship of the people. Um, so we spent so much, I mean, George Barna built a huge, really, you know, effort here at, at the company just to focus on healthy and growing churches. And again, it's quite complex, but it's also simpler than we realize uh, in terms of trying to really focus in on the things that matter most and measuring those things as leaders and trying to orient our, our discipleship towards the things that really help to, you know, build these deep disciples. Yeah. So churches that are, have, have given much of their or most of their energy into whatever the appointed hour is for the, the worship service or the fellowship, um, that focus alone, they're probably really struggling right now because that's happening in new ways or not happening at all. Um, but you're talking about churches that have really been engaged deeply into um, the spiritual um, uh, life throughout the body, wherever the body may be. That's right, yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's, it's one of those things where focusing on the worship service is like a, a necessary but insufficient you know, indicator. Almost every church right. is going to focus on, right. on at least that. Um, and obviously this last year has shown so many of the, the ways in which just sort of planning on people to show up isn't going to be enough. Right. Uh, but um, but there's ways in which you're, as you're as you're planning those w worship services, as you're thinking about the impact of the prayer ministry on your community, as you think about efforts to serve you know students and young people in your community, serving the poor, um, as you're thinking about uh, you know thinking about evangelism and preparing people to share their faith in the community, uh, this this mindset mindset shift towards serving outsiders and towards you know being a church for the good of the community, not just for yourselves. Is, is a very important sort of indicator of, you know, how healthy you are as an organization and as a church. Yeah, well, very interesting. We'll make sure that resource is available to uh, our viewers uh, through our website. Um, let me ask you about um, young people, young Christians, uh, or even beyond, just young people in general, as they might relate to uh, the Christian faith. What's going on with young people in this moment? I, we were talking earlier about our kids and and uh, really amazed what they're going through. Yeah. Uh, uh, what do you see with young people right now in our churches? Well, um, there's been a huge hit to millennials and especially Gen Z students today. And remind us definitionally. Uh, so so millenni millennials would be um, uh, 23 and up to about, th about 40. Uh, and then Gen Z would be 22 and, and younger. Okay. Uh, so college and younger. and. Um, um, you know, there's been a, the cover article of Time Magazine was, you know, sort of the, the, the lost generation or the right. impact of the generation, the impact of COVID on this generation and uh, the lost year, you know. And so for students that are in these cycles, you know, if you have a year and a half or so, two years of, of your academic career sort of just, you know, all zoomed out, right. um, you know, you, you, you miss some of these important milestones. And I don't think we really understand quite how important that's going to be over the long run in, in terms of jobs, in terms of confidence, in terms of mental health and anxiety. I think we're gonna have a tsunami of mental health challenges that the church has to be prepared for. Uh, you know, we just finished this big study with uh, the Boone Center uh, right. for the family at Pepperdine uh, called Restoring Relationships, another great resource that would be worth you checking out because it really talks a lot about um, mental health, anxiety, por porn use, relationships and intimacy. Right. And um, you know that churches is another another example of ways that churches can be uh, highly focused on you know impact into their communities is by caring about the real relational needs that families and households and the next generation have, and so we were rightly concerned I think as leaders about the impact of the coronavirus on older communities, older members of our community, but uh, but the mental health and the vocational health and the financial health. The educational rhythms of this generation, younger people, has been greatly disrupted. Levels of anxiety just keep month over month rising. And, and so how can we show up as a community of faith and say, no, you're, you're, you matter here, you're known, we, we want to pray for you, we want to get you the resources you need, we want to give you counseling, we want to be able to help you go through you know, um, responding well to all the crisis around you, because that's going to help you grow and become more resilient. And if you don't, you might have other you know, challenges that arise in your life, but, but this generation has faced a lot, and they were already facing a lot yes. in terms of the, um, as I said earlier, sort of the plausibility of Christianity. A lot of my research focuses on the disconnections of Christianity to younger generations, and, 
they're pretty significant. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really convinced that the church is not prepared for Generation Z. The ways we think about discipleship, the, uh, I'd say you can't mass produce disciples. You know, I think in, in uh, Church of Christ is something you, you, you see and understand maybe more than in other traditions. I mean, I even think some of the important ways that you guys orient yourselves in terms of educational institutions like Pepperdine and um, even some of the, the um, you know, uh, uh, just the ways you think about youth ministry and, and other things are, 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 are a bit unique even from other Protestant denominations and it serves you well. Uh, but, but we can't rest on any of that. We've got to really think creatively and with this emerging generation yeah. so that we can have pathways that lead them closer and closer into Jesus. Um, so there's a lot of work we did on that, on that subject, this project called Faith for Exiles, which was really focusing on these five different things that are sort of research-driven, research-proven pathways for discipleship. And um, they're not easy, but they are, there are some real patterns and, and approaches to discipleship that I think are gonna make a difference for transferring faith in a lasting way to the emerging generation. Yeah, I, I think this is such an important topic if <clears throat> you're thinking about the future of our churches, because um, I, I, I agree, I don't see that we are prepared for this. Um, one, I'm, I'm not sure there's a full recognition of just how the scale of this. Yep. But there's also an element that uh, is surprising to me. I have some friends who are um, uh, mental health professionals that work with students, uh, several who were very much engaged with, uh, you know, uh, after the borderline shooting uh, several years ago where we lost a student. Uh, young people are fearful. Yep. Uh, there had been a fire, the Woolsey fire, just the year before that. Um, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, and it's producing... Um, just a lot of, uh, uh, it's debilitating really, and, and, and dangerous. And, and I don't think we fully grasp the, the scale of it, but we also struggle to sometimes understand how faith and mental health and counseling and all that work together, you know. Right. Um, uh, we have a lot of folks that occasionally will come to us and say, well, uh, they ought to be just praying about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, trust Jesus. Well, of course we do. You know, of course we pray about it. But there's more there. There's, yeah. there, there's more that can be done there. Um, so that interplay between faith and the profession of counseling and all, um, I don't know, I see some gaps there, I think. Well, uh, listen, this generation has a lot of um, built-in challenges, and I don't want to make excuses for them. I want to actually just have a level yeah. set of what, what they face. They face a very tough economy. They face now uh, a, a whole educational environment that's been blown apart by COVID. Uh, they, and, and, and as a consequence, that job economy is even tougher. Uh, they face the, the crisis of overchoice. They believe they can do anything they want. Uh, but you know, I believe God's made us for a certain kind of thing. It's not like one career, but like we need a richer theology of vocation and calling. We have a generation who's raised by parents who are the most safety oriented mm -hmm. that we have seen in a generation, and it's really hard to disciple people if you're trying to disciple them for an American version of safe, comfortable, nothing really bad's gonna happen to you, because uh, that's not truth, and it's not uh, the truth they're living in, it's not, the, it's not the reality of the world they're living in, and it's not a gospel story either. Right. Um, the most resilient people face adversity. Uh, we haven't really prepared this generation for adversity. Um, and then they're being discipled by their screens, um, just as older people are. We're all, right. all discipled by our screens, but the reality of social media and like what really counts in life, it's a, it's a very distorted view of how to live a life of meaning and purpose and conscience and Christian conviction. So I, I'm always a bit of an advocate for us, like, hey, let's show these kids some grace. This next generation are more than kids now. Um, let's really uh, like help enable them to see the world of, of risks and of, of preparation and of, of where, where godly ambition can fit. Um, and I, I'm convinced that um, some of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament is a, a great place to, to, to disciple them. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ecclesiastes speaks to an ambitious generation. Uh, Song of Songs is a weird book, but it's, you know, it's like God even cares about our sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, um, Lamentations is a book about how do you lament properly. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at, at, at a, a generation who on their screens is seeing the, the, the death and, and, and questions around uh, p sort of um, sort of p police and policing and black lives. Uh, again, there's lots of different opinions about this, but you have to understand that this generation is seeing these things 
in a visceral way that no other generation has seen. It's why we're all sort of responding in different ways to these moments of, of justice and of, of, of tragedy in the world. And, and so how do, we, how do we help this generation have a theology of lament and uh, recognizing that there's deep brokenness in the world and, yeah. and, and, and things that our Christian conviction calls us to. Um, so I think those are such great opportunities for the church, but we tend to sell a version of Christianity that's that's very like heaven oriented. It's like just if just get saved, and then everything else is going to be just fine. Uh, but I'm I'm really convinced that this generation is looking for a deeper yeah. theology of how to live this stuff out. And yeah. I think I think we can again find our our way through the pages of Scripture towards towards that deeper theology. Yeah, I, I really do see young people at Pepperdine and other places really rejecting transactional faith. I yeah. mean, this. It doesn't make sense to them just to check in. That's why we don't see them at church sometime on Sundays like we should. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead of just wagging the finger or lamenting kids these days, uh, we're talking about the future of, of our churches. Right. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Our, um, a year or so ago, uh, we welcomed our first class of students who were born after 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we, we're talking about um, young people who are living in a world that had an awful lot built into it already. And it's always been the way. It's not necessarily right. unique to them, but they have their fair share, if not more than their fair share. So David, as we kind of wrap up here, I wanted to um, ask you a question that I'm sure is impossible to answer, and that is about um, the future of our churches and, and what you see next as we begin to move out of quarantine back together. I did hear a minister uh, the other day said he could not wait until things got back to normal. Um, I, I wonder what your studies are showing you, some of, the, some of the data is showing you. I'm interested in what you're looking at right now, but help us think about what you're seeing and what's likely to be next. It is hard to predict, right? I mean, that's one of the things you learn as a researcher is it's hard to go too far in the future. Who would have predicted, you know, coronavirus or some of the things that we've been through the last year? Uh, but certainly we know some things to be true about our current environment. Uh, the disruption goes very deep. It's a deep psychological disruption. Uh, we, can, we can try to reassure people as much as we like uh, that things are back to normal, uh, but their trust in institutions is shaken. Their trust in, uh, in being around other people is different. Um, you've got some people that are, as, as you know, pro-masks, anti-masks, pro-vax, vaccination, anti-vaccination. Uh, the political environment still is is very un, unsteadying for people, um, and so I think um, we've seen in the research that one in five regular churchgoers say they were going to essentially sit the whole the whole pandemic out. They weren't going to do any online church. They're just sort of like they're they're come back someday maybe, but a lot of their they were and these things connect. I think prior to the pandemic, people were renegotiating their relationship to local churches. A really active churchgoer comes only 1.7 times a month, really active. Wow. And so, you know, they were already renegotiating the frequency and the depth of their commitment to local churches. Um, and I, I just think we're gonna see a lot, of, a lot of deep change in people's hearts and minds about what they need the church for. Of course, they do need it. It's not what they, whether they do need it. Right. It's just how are we as church leaders gonna show up and be the church in their lives in this new, in this new reality, and especially among young people who, even before coronavirus, were telling us they were you know, watching or you know, listening to podcasts or other forms of spiritual input and output as part of their spiritual diet. Um, so I think it's actually a, a a really great future because it turns out if you're going to disciple someone to be flourishing in all these dimensions of life, you can't just convene them 1.7 times a month, give them a little sermon, sing a cappella <laughs> songs, right. <laughs> and hope they're going to be changed. You have to disciple them across their whole life in various ways. Heart mind, heart, mind, body, and soul. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm actually pretty hopeful about that kind of future and the kind of ways in which the church is going to have to uh, do that holistic ministry. And we've had, we've had now a year of practicing doing this. And listen, I'm the first to tell you I can't wait to be back uh, in a church and singing my heart out and all the rest. Uh, but I think we should be prepared for a, a lot of differences in, in terms of what people are mentally and emotionally, psychologically ready to, to give and receive. I think it's gonna take us some real time and, and the kind of future, I mean, just look at the workplace. You know, yes. like all of a sudden people realize, hey, we can get a lot of this stuff done 
Um, we have one, one uh, colleague here, Barna, who's, who just absolutely never wanted to work at home. And I talked to her a few days ago. She's like, you know, it is pretty darn nice <laughs> to, commu to commute from the, the kitchen yeah. table to my workstation. And, you know, she's like talking about all the gas she's saving and the, you know, the time she's saving. She's like, there's a few things that are, that are not as nice. But, you know, there's some fundamental shifts that people are going to be bringing with them now. Right. And um, let's just use our creative imaginations to say how can God and our church partner with what people are doing now, not to give them permission to, you know, just mm -hmm. sort of exist out here and sort of orbiting the church, but actually to integrate them more into the life of the church. That would be my, my challenge to church leaders today. Yeah. Did the churches have a, a chance to come together, uh, work together? Uh, is there unity that's possible uh, after this moment? I see a lot of um, uh, anxiety, um, uh, adversity, um, dissatisfaction, sort of anger toward one another. I think it'll be hard. Um, I have hope that that will be the case. I think church leaders always want to work together. It's always harder. There's a little bit of a sort of a small business proprietor yeah. uh, mindset. And I just ask you, you know, with, with great humility to consider others, you know, equal to or better than yourselves. How can we as the church exist for the sake of our, our cities and our communities? We're actually doing a big cities initiative because we think all trends are local. And we want to try to help you as church leaders understand the trends in your city so you can look for more of that about barn of cities. But, um, you know, the, the effort to come together, it's like I think we always want to come together as church leaders uh, in our mind. I don't know that we always want to do that in our heart. Yeah. And I think that's going to be something of the, of the stumbling block. Listen, we're all exhausted. We, we know as leaders you're tired. You're not sure what's coming at you next. You feel alone and isolated. Uh, but we want to see you better connected, informed, ready to go and do ministry in new ways, be, being really well equipped for you know, life in the real world that we're, all, that we're all facing. One way I think we can actually be more unified is recognizing that there's all these gifts and giftedness in the body of Christ. And I think this whole coronavirus has reminded us that it's not just those of us who are in the profession of ministry who are ministers. And so, you know, re releasing every gift in your community mm -hmm. uh, for the service of bringing glory to Jesus and, and you know, giving people a real job to do yes. uh, is a great opportunity for the church. And so that's one way we can pursue unity is maybe we won't be always unified in exact theology or all the things that, you know, sort of usually, usually you would sort of say, well, we won't move forward unless we can all agree. Well, let's, you know, let's, there's a certain sort of Christian ethic uh, around the, the creedal faith. And we can all agree that we want to see every person's potential in Christ released for the good of its community, of, of his or her community. And um, I think the church can be a, a wonderful place of deployment. And that gets to something we talked about earlier. The churches that are most effective, the communities of faith that are the most powerful, the ones that are most I uh, indispensable to their communities are those that have released the, 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 the God-given talent and giftedness in its people. I, I'm of the mindset that, that the church must use this moment to come together. Yeah. Uh, whatever has been dividing us before, whatever the fractures are, whatever the dividing lines are, uh, there is more reason than ever <laughs> to really become the body of Christ for the benefit of the kingdom. Um, David, it is so good to be with you. Um, I appreciate our friendship, and uh, it's been a long time since we could be together. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, some of your thoughts about uh, the moment we're in. Thanks, Rick. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Of course.